Uh, so today we're going to talk about how to build a stellar college list. <laughs> and the stellar, I think it's really important. Uh, people will talk a lot about fit throughout the process of college admissions. Um, when you know people are assessing those, those applications, they'll be asking themselves about fit. You know, does the student fit our school, our academic profile, you know, our social life? Um, and often the questions students will have to answer in their essays are regarding fit for some of the schools. They'll have to write about why they think they're a good fit. So the best way to ensure that the process is as smooth um, and, you know, as solid as possible is to make sure that the list uh, reflects a good fit. Um, so the way, I'll go ahead and start the slideshow, why not? Um, the way that we'll kind of walk you through this is through the various steps of assembling the list. Um, so, you know, the first one is to determine what you're looking for. Then we'll understand the tools for of your college list, create a draft list, refine your list, finalize and organize the list, and then have a bunch of questions. Uh, we're not going to get all of these things done in the session, but I'm going to tell you how to do them. Um, and then we should have plenty of time for your questions. Um, so the first thing that this process should really begin with is some deep reflection on what a student and the parents want to get out of the college experience. Um, it's, college is one of those times where almost everybody comes to this process with preconceived notions about what college is all about, what college was when, you know, a parent or a family member went to it. Uh, and it's an opportunity for people to really pause and think, um, you know, do they understand what they want to get out of college? Do they understand what college is like for students these days? Um, all of those things. So really, if the college search process begins with a good dose of reflection, that's really a, a great place to start. Um, so, you know, before a student might have, you know, their, their list picked out or, or have favorites or anything like that, it's, it's totally a good idea to just sit down and think a little more abstractly about those questions. Um, and since abstract is hard, <laughs> Signet has this really great guide, uh, we call it the personal college inventory, uh, that helps you think about this. So I'll show you, I'll preview this for you, uh, and then you'll get this, as Sheila said, in an email afterwards. Um, so this is just a document that goes through the basics of, like, what are the factors that you consider when thinking about college? Um, beginning with something like the area of the country, climate, uh, certain types of settings, such as city or urban, size of school. And this, this goes on um, to other factors such as, you know, social life and, um, you know, the type of, type of uh, university that you'd be looking at or college. Um, the idea is, is one that this helps you spark a conversation. Um, it may be that when your student is looking through these things, they may not have thought about what the difference between a, a liberal arts college and a, a large state research university is. Uh, and that gives you an opportunity to really think about like, okay, what, you know, how important is one-on-one -on -one attention from, from professors? How important is research opportunities? Um, you begin to kind of parse these things. So this is an opportunity to, for a first kind of thinking about and, and discussing those things. And really quite conveniently, most of the things on this list are things that you can use to search for colleges. <laughs> um, so, you know, once you've filled this out, even if it's the roughest kind of um, pass through it, you can search for colleges that are between 2,000 and 5,000 students in an urban setting in Massachusetts. Uh, and then you'll have you know, a list of places to start looking. Uh, so it's really a nice tool that you can use to start. Uh, and it's something that you'd want to come back to again later. Um, because, you know, once you learn more about colleges, think more about it, maybe do some visits, those uh, preferences will get refined. Uh, so yeah, so that's a great place that we recommend starting. Uh, and it's really nice to see, like, if you're, as, as a parent, if your vision of where your student is going to college is different from theirs, it's a great time to talk about it. Um, there's a lot to be learned there, and it doesn't all have to be resolved immediately at this stage. Um, 
sometimes students or parents may think something's a right choice um, and a little more research will, will change that perspective. So once you have kind of a, a rough outline of, of maybe some of the, the major preferences um, that are emerging. And I forgot to mention one thing. On that sheet, it asks you to prioritize um, the different areas. Don't skip that part. I think it's really, really helpful because you know you may you may block out may answer all those questions and know that like okay I said this size I said this location, but maybe size isn't the most important like factor in choosing the schools. Uh, so it's useful to know what is the most important thing, um, and you know kind of to go through those. It, the activity forces you to think a little more deeply about your priorities, uh, and it allows you to, if, if you find that your list has become too narrow, it allows you to start broadening it. Okay, so once you have kind of these rough preferences and, and outlines and you've had this nice discussion, um, now's the time to really dig in to learn more about these schools beyond, you know, just the name and location and size and those factors. Uh, so the, the resources that we recommend here um, are ones that we all use as consultants and we work with students um, to use. Uh, Naviance and SCORE, these are ones that would be available through your student's school. So it's likely they either use one or the other, and they're fairly similar. Um, they are really excellent resources in that they, you know, they provide information about schools, like you can do research on them but they also provide information uh, based on the, the application success rate from the student's high school. Uh, so you can see a, a scattergram of the, um, you know, your GPA of all the students that applied their SAT or ACT scores and whether they were admitted, waitlisted um, or rejected. So that's, you know, that kind of analysis uh, is getting a little ahead of the process, um, but it's useful. I wanted to bring that up as we're, as we're talking about Naviance and SCORE because um, that's a thing, a really powerful way that students can start to understand how competitive they are compared to uh, students within their own school. No, I don't want to think. Okay. Um, oops. Let's go back. Uh, so that one's, that one's extremely, extremely robust and useful. The scatter Scattergrams may be overwhelming at first, which is fine. It's okay to like not, not quite deal with them um, until you learn a little more basics about the schools. Um, so the, 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 the next four resources um, are great for getting sort of background information. Um, so Big Future is run by College Board. Uh, so it's a website that provides sort of general information and descriptions about schools. Uh, so it's a really trustworthy way to look up like what is the student faculty ratio? You know, what is the average SAT range of the, um, at the school, their selectivity rating? Um, all of that information can be gotten like pretty much at a glance uh, and it's all fairly standardized. So that's like a nice kind of non-overwhelming way to get the, the very basics about a school. Um, other sites such as, as Niche um, and collegeresults.org, um, well, Niche will say, offers uh, reviews as well. So you have the opportunity to hear from students, uh, their perspectives of what's going on at the schools and what they say about it. So that, that offers another layer of, uh, of information uh, that can be really helpful as you're narrowing down schools. Uh, collegeresults.org provides a really robust uh, search feature that you can look for specific measures, um, you know, really fine tune it. So, you know, if your student is interested in something like robotics and you're like, my school has got to have a robotics program. Um, well then, yeah, then you'll find a way to, to search, you know, all the schools that offer that as a major within certain other specifications. And the FIS guide is, uh, you know, it, it offers kind of a general through vision and perspective of, of the colleges you're looking at. Uh, and students have found that to be fairly accessible as well. Um, so at this stage, it's not necessarily about finding the exact right college. Um, these resources are useful in giving you um, kind of an overall picture, uh, and it's it's not going to be as um, as detailed as when you start really, really doing your research and digging into the schools. Um, and that involves extensively looking through their website, you know, maybe going on a visit if it's one of the top schools or is conveniently located. Um, all of that can come later. 
this, these ones are, are, are quite useful in this exploratory phase of researching. Um, and as you research, part of what you're doing in this process is learning more about preferences, right? Like listening to your students and seeing it's like, oh, what, what really interests them about these schools that they're looking at, what's important to them, what don't they like, um, you know, that's as, as important as like finding, finding the perfect school, which you're probably not gonna find immediately through this process. Um, this is about refining uh, what, what you're hey, looking for. Hey, Rekha, on cycle to home, where we Cycle. Sorry, can I ask everyone to mute themselves? That would be helpful for us. Okay. Thank um, you. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, okay, so after you've done that sort of that that process and and looked to um, you know start started making like a broad list, uh, now it's time to really take a stab at at the list. Um, <laughs> so as, as you've looked at these things, is it a good time to to circle back to that um, personal college inventory sheet that I showed you? See if anything's changed. Um, see if you know, some of these categories have opened up or whether some sort of ideas or preferences have been, have been sharpened. Um, that's really, you know, it's a, it's a useful exercise to do. Um, now we want to fold in information about selectivity uh, and the student's candidacy. So, you know, if we have the GPA and the SAT and ACT scores, um, that's when we can start really looking at okay, what's, what's fitting in the various ranges? Um, what are target safety and reach schools for this student? Um, and that's when a tool like Naviance or SCORE, that scatter plot can really come in handy because uh, you can visualize like, okay, you know, within, within the, this, this high school class, this is where the student falls. Um, is this a range where we can feel fairly confident of admission or is it a stretch? Um, so I'll show you this, this chart that you'll also receive uh, via email. Um, that gives you a, a, a fairly rough estimate of selectivity for schools. Um, yep. So these are fairly straightforward. Um, so the SAT average section score, you know, you would, you would choose either, you know, the average or verbal um, or math, uh, say we're at 680. Um, we would look at like that's you know likely in the highly competitive category if the GPA is above uh, a 3.0, but it may drop to the very competitive category as the GPA goes lower. Um, and we have the same with the ACT. Um, so you can do this to get rough estimates. Um, we also have this resource here that ranks selectivity um, of colleges in in, their, in these various categories. So these, this gives you a rough estimate that does not necessarily take into account the rigor of the high school and reputation and weighting. Um, so something like this is, is, is useful, but I'd say take it with, with a grain of salt. Um, the nice thing about Naviance uh, and SCORE is that when they show those scatter grants, and it, it will be similar, it will look similar um, to this with dots of you know, the various students that have been admitted or, um, or rejected, uh, that is taking into account what these colleges know about the, you know, the rigor of the high school and how a certain um, weighted GPA, weighted or unweighted, stacks up against the rest of the class. Um, so it's only really helpful if many students from the high school have applied to a certain school, um, but it takes into account that in the application process. Um, so all of these things together, none of them is a, is a magic formula and none of them will kind of guarantee admission, um, but they're, they're tools where you can start to see like, okay, if I'm repeatedly in each of these tools showing up in you know, a very competitive category and I'm within the SAT range and the GPA range for this college, we can become fairly confident that you know, this is a good target school. Um, okay. So uh, the next we advise using your preferences and selectivity information to start searching for specific schools. Um, 
so we can start to see, you know, of, of the colleges, you know, if you found, like if you had a certain long list or if you came across certain ones um, that you felt might, might be a good fit in the earlier search, now is the time to dive back in and look at the, look at the, you know, the details about selectivity um, and about preferences to double check that those fit um, and to see where you fall relative to uh, their selectivity measures. Um, and so then I'm going to show you the spreadsheet, which is very robust, <laughs> but this is an excellent tool as we start, um, what, you know, once you know that something is, is, is making it on the list, uh, then we're getting into a phase where you will want to start information gathering and recording information about these schools. Um, once, once we're, you know, pretty sure that like a school is, you know, it may make it on the list, we're really seriously considering it. Um, then you're going to want to start recording, you know, impressions, information, you don't want to have to keep looking up something over and over again. Um, so the idea is that, you know, you can sit down and fill out part of this spreadsheet. Uh, and then you can return to it later, you know, as as your preferences develop as you find other schools and then compare them. Um, so, you know, there's various categories here. Uh, let's see, you know, we, the college name, um, we rank it by enthusiasm, um, but also we want to note the selectivity category. I'll get into that uh, a little more, the ideal numbers uh, for likely targets and reaches. Um, college name, uh, deadlines, super important. <laughs> <laughs> because that's gonna, really going to drive and organize your spreadsheet later on. Uh, for right now, while we have, while we're doing our research, we just want to note it now. Um, so, you know, have your scores here. It says ACT, but you can switch it to, uh, to SAT, depending on which test you're doing. Um, if, you're, if you plan on going test optional, then probably put a, a column in here that says test optional that you check off, just to make sure that you've, you know, you've checked that they're going test optional for this year and you're not setting yourself up uh, for a surprise or disappointment. Uh, and so there's additional information here. I won't go over all of it. But what's important is that this spreadsheet and ones like it have a lot of categories for note-taking about preference. You know, what, what are you interested? In? What do you like? What are clubs you like? What are opportunities and facilities that interest you? What's the academic philosophy? Um, in these categories, we'll delve in deeper into things that will set the school apart from other ones, besides just geography or reputation or selectivity. We want to know, like, does this school have a, you know, social justice oriented academic philosophy that you know, is, is something that carries through the entire institution. We really need to know that. Um, one, to see if it fits us. Uh, and two, when we're writing essays and we're developing our candidacy, we're really going to need to show that our values align with the philosophy of the, of the school. Um, so this information comes in handy all throughout the process, not just for choosing the schools, but once we're writing essays and once we're, we're you know, planning the, the, our overall common application essays, all of those things, we're going to want to make sure that we're expressing things that articulate how we fit with the university. Um, Bless you, honey. And then, uh, then we really get into like essay questions and the nitty gritty. Uh, some people may not go that far at this stage. Um, this may be something that you deal with later as we gear up towards applications, but it's all there if you need it. Um, okay, so I will go back to the slideshow. Uh, and please, when you decide to take a school off your list, you probably want to keep the notes. Um, it's a good idea. You can move it down a little and maybe gray it out like, you know, change the font cover, color to gray, but you'll probably forget why you decided to take a school off your list and you might still keep returning to it, you know, or have someone recommend it. Uh, and it's just really helpful to know that, you know, I considered it, I decided it was not for me because of this reason, you know, the, the surrounding town wasn't safe. 
Uh, and if you just write that note on there, that'll save you a lot of trouble later on, because uh, you may forget why, why you are really excited about or why you're not excited about certain schools. Um, great. And we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about COVID because <laughs> it's thing. <laughs> and it's something that has affected every aspect of, of admissions. Um, you know, one of the more glaring ones is the test optional policy that many schools have taken on temporarily. Some of them have gone test blind. Um, this is, it's, you know, it's really important and it, it can be a great opportunity for some students as well, but it doesn't mean that standardized tests are, are completely going away or that they're gone. Um, in many cases, it's if you can perform competitively on the standardized tests, it's definitely in your advantage to do so, unless you're exclusively looking at test blind schools like the UC system. Um, so that's, you know, the, a, a topic for another webinar, um, but it's something to keep in mind when you're making your list be aware of, you know, which schools are test optional, um, if they're test blind. Um, that's, that's an important thing to keep track of because it, it affects your, um, your candidacy and how strong it is. Um, one other thing is that um, there's more limited college visits, um, so they tend to fill up faster. <laughs> it takes a little more planning, um, and I really do recommend signing up for official tours, having your presence recorded when you visit a college is really helpful, uh, in part because many of these colleges are tracking demonstrated interest, uh, especially if it's, a, if it's a smaller school. Uh, they really wanna know that, that you visited uh, and, and the interest that you're showing. So a little planning can go a long way there, you know, signing up early and signing up for official tours. Um, and you know, in, if you can't visit, that's fine as well. You can use online tools to look at key key buildings or features. You can do a lot of information by um, a lot of information. You can get a lot of information uh, via the web as well. That's creepily also tracked by them, <laughs> and it's part of their you know understanding of demonstrated interest. So doing that kind of research is really important uh, in and it does affect admissions outcomes at many schools. Not all schools um, track demonstrated interests, but many of them do. Um, and finally, it affects how people have been applying and the results we've been getting. A lot of people are staying closer to home. Uh, you know, in New England, that's, that's where a lot of amazing colleges are. That's also where a lot of amazing high schools are. So many schools in the New England area have gotten more competitive, uh, and we've sort of sort of seen a change in uh, admissions rates and for students that are staying closer to home. Uh, that's something to kind of consider. Uh, and it's also something that can be changing year to year. Uh, so it's good to keep an eye on that. Uh, I'm happy to answer specific questions about that and dig in more depth later if people have them in the Q&A. Um, okay, so now we're building that list. Uh, we're adding schools and, and sort of vetting them. Um, the next step is, is refining it. Um, so, you know, if we have a list that fits their needs, wants, and skills, which is good, right? We want to be realistic about, you know, what we want to get out of college, what, what are our areas of growth, and what areas are we really pushing ourselves in? Um, please, please, please don't, like, resist the temptation to make it an encyclopedic list. Um, there are really diminishing returns when you get above, you know, even like 12 applications, uh, in part because it takes a lot of research and a lot of commitment to demonstrate fit at these schools. So when you start applying to more and more, you know, it may feel like you're, you're playing the odds, um, but you're spreading yourself really thin. Uh, and it generally, we see, has diminishing returns. We really recommend that students limit their lists to no more than eight to 12 schools um, because you have to you have to really imagine yourself there and to, to prepare a strong application for these schools. Uh, we recommend two to three safety, a three to four target, um, and two to three reach schools. Um, I wouldn't reiterate. So even if you're scoring extremely highly or have a high GPA, um, certain schools, if their selectivity is you know they're letting in less than twelve percent of students, they're always going to be a reach. Um, there's very little that you can do to, to really 
kind of say that, yeah, I'm a, I'm a solid, a, a solid in um, or likely at those schools. Um, so keep in mind that, that, you know, being sure to, of, of the most prestigious selective schools, it's, it's really great to thoughtfully choose the few that you will pursue. Um, and finally, uh, remember that it's a family decision, that discussion and disagreement are all part of it. And honestly, the earlier you start having those discussions, the more likely you are to find kind of common ground and, and resolution over time doing them. Um, so I think it's, it's good to, to have these conversations with an open mind and an open heart um, and know that it's, you know, it, this, the process of, of applying for schools, researching them, and then, you know, admissions decisions and finally deciding where to go. It's a period of tremendous growth. Um, and I think for, for everybody really, and approaching it in that, with that mindset can be really helpful. Yeah, so troubleshooting, <laughs> it may be really hard to refine your list. Um, so visiting colleges can be one of a great tool to do this. Uh, even if sort of early on you, you know, visit a college that's convenient rather than an absolute top choice, right? Like if it's one that's close by, um, it can really help clarify what priorities are for students. Um, they may not know that, oh, how a campus feels or proximity to a city is very important to them until they're on the ground. And they're like, oh, wow, yeah, this is, this is it. This is what I want. Um, so doing those, you know, you don't have to visit every single school, um, but doing some uh, of the visits can really highlight what it is you're looking for uh, and help you build out that list. Um, so that's something that can often, especially if a student is dragging their feet on exerting preferences, um, they think everything's great. <laughs> uh, a campus visit sometimes is a great way to, to get them to, um, to buckle down a little and, and have some preferences there. Um, think about what it's like to get to and from school, right? Like a, a, you know, awesome rural campus in Idaho may sound great, <laughs> but you've got to decide like, okay, this is, this is what it will take for you to come home for break. Like this is how often um, you can come home. That, that can be appealing to some people uh, or it can, you know, diminish an appeal of, of certain locations for students. Um, and then getting, getting students to just really imagine their life. Uh, I like to walk them through it, either if they're free writing or just narrating to me, just like, okay, just describe what you think a day will look like uh, in college, junior year, it's spring, <laughs> go. Um, this can help a student really think about, one, like, what are their ideas about college? Um, you know, what, what, what do they already hold in their head? But also, you know, are there some things in, about the day-to-day -day life that they really want? Um, and finally, doing more research more research. Um, we have another handout that can be really helpful uh, in kind of brainstorming, right? Like if we're, if we're stuck and we're like, okay, I don't know what else to ask about colleges or to think about them. They all seem equal or the same. Here's a list of questions that can help. Um, and it guides you to certain features that, that do make a difference to students, um, like the, the size of classes. If, if a student is extremely introverted and is likely to get lost in, in large classes and not participate, um, then that's something where, yeah, like a, a smaller college or a college that offers smaller classes is likely to be a really good idea. Um, and then um, kind of looking, this, this offers many different um, ideas there uh, about things to ask about. Um, one I wanted to bring up was recently I was working with a student um, and he even brought up, you know, job placement was really important to him. But he was going to college um, and he wanted to go to a tech oriented school, but it was important to him to, to get a good job afterwards because that was the motivating factor. Um, and so we did, we looked up, made that a, a category on our spreadsheet and looked up job placement statistics. Um, so, you know, the success rate of students after graduating, whether they found a job or, or went to continuing education graduate school afterwards. Um, and that actually led him to decide against a school and really be more enthusiastic about another school. Um, so sometimes it's, you know, highlighting a new category that's tied to um, a motivation or a preference can snap some of these um, questions into place uh, and get things off a list or move something higher up on a list as well. Um, 
so this is a great resource. I'd say, you know, after you have your draft list and you're working on refining it. Um, all right. Did I start, I stopped sharing. Yes. <laughs> You can't just go pressing random buttons and expect it to do what you want. Uh, all right, so next we're gonna organize our list. Uh, so if you've been filling out the spreadsheet, little by little, uh, finally, you know, you've got a, a, a list um, of H10 schools and you have a sense of it. Well, now this spreadsheet can turn into uh, a priority document, right? You have the the due dates, um, likely with your enthusiasm level, you can start turning what's on that spreadsheet um, into, you know, deciding your due dates if you're applying early for certain schools, um, early decision or early action. Uh, that's an important decision, but it's a strategic one that's really based on fit. Um, and then you can then work through it. So in this, we recommend you can even add links on the spreadsheet to a, a folder uh, that has your, your documents for that school. Uh, so it keeps you focused and it keeps you moving one task at a time. Um, you can even have a little checkbox and check it off when you apply, which is always, always satisfying. Um, but these kind of things, you know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel to keep track of the applications once you start applying and getting into application mode. You've already done that work during the research phase. Um, so also, get, get second opinions. Talk to people. Uh, it's really important that if you know, you, you think that, you know, you have this great list or something and, and someone may be able to look at it and be like, oh, okay, like you've included only small liberal arts colleges. That's great. But would it be nice to diversify slightly just in case, you know, an interest develops in the meantime um, or, you know, that you want to have this as an option. Um, so, Sometimes, you know, just getting, you can be so focused on, on a something, some aspect of the list that you may miss um, a feature about making it balanced um, or need that kind of dose of reality from someone else. Okay, and now I'm done. So I will stop sharing my screen now for real. Thank you, Holly. That was really great. Um, I'm sure there are plenty of questions because this is a very um, nuanced topic and uh, we had to, we, you know, you did it in 40 minutes or less actually. So I'm sure there are things that people want to hear uh, a little bit more detail about. Um, was that a question? Might have just been somebody chatting to a family member. Um, so feel free to come off mute and ask a question, or you can put it in the chat and we'll go through it together. Um, and then, of course, I'll make sure I'll, I'll put our emails in the chat as well, so that in case you want to email us a question or set up another time to talk, you can do that as well. So give me mine, signeteducation.com, and then Holly is holly at signeteducation.com. Um, but let's hear your questions. No questions. You you answered everything, Holly. Um, I have a number of questions, so I'll just start, and maybe someone will jump in here. Um, I think um, a lot of uh, a lot of people are really worried. I'm going to try not to stump you, Holly, as well. A lot of people, not that you can be stumped, but a lot of people are really worried um, for a number of reason, uh, reasons about sending their kids off to college. Now, one is you know education has been so let's just say shaky for the last two years. Um, many may wonder if, if their student is really prepared to go off to college. Um, I think a lot of our clients in particular have realized that their student has uh, some sort of undiagnosed learning difference or an executive function challenge. Um, and then sending them off to college means that they're independent and on their own. And how do we make sure they're gonna be okay? Um, do you have any advice for, um, considering colleges or building a college list with those sorts of concerns in mind? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that um, in, in considering fit and academic fit, often people look at it in the terms of selectivity, right? Like, do my grades and scores measure up? Am I good enough for them? But I think especially in terms if a student has you know, a need for, for accommodations for additional support from universities or, or colleges, um, it's really important to ask if they measure up to your standards. 
Um, many schools will invest a, a ton in student accessibility services um, in making sure that students have you know, resources available. Um, and even beyond student accessibility services like that you might need an accommodation for, they may have very robust learning centers, mentorship programs, writing centers, things like that, many of them award-winning. Um, so finding that information, you know, it can be a little hard on websites because all the universe, all the colleges and universities are selling themselves on their websites. You know, they have a team designed to make themselves look, as, you know, as good as possible. Um, so often places to go for that kind of information are, you know, external sites that would have reviews uh, like Niche. Um, you can go to YouTube. Uh, there's like student, uh, student reviews and things like that about these sites. Um, and that's something to rank in a very important feature of choosing colleges uh, if, if you think that your student might need um, or benefit from additional support at those schools. Um, because we work, and I, I love working with college students, um, because I think it's, it's a tremendous time of, of growth uh, and, and independence. Um, but one of the things I always work with them on when I'm coaching them is, you know, have you have you tried to take advantage of, you know, the, the TAs that are there just sitting there waiting to tutor you, uh, the, you know, the writing center that, you know, they're, they're there just waiting for you to come in with your papers to work with you. Um, and, but some schools are better than others about what they offer um, and how easy it is to get to it, right? If it's a, you know, a giant school with uh, 80,000 people and there's just one learning center that's across campus that may not be as accessible uh, or beneficial, um, as you know, a smaller school that might have one that's in walking distance of a dorm. Thank you. That's that's very very helpful. Other questions? We can get into specifics too. If you want to say, I have a, you know, this kind of kid. What kind of colleges should we look at? <laughs> We're happy to talk through it right now. We've got fifteen more minutes, so please use this time. Oh, hi, I'm Sherry. <laughs> Um, I am wondering about extracurricular extracurricular activities. Uh, is would be one question, and my other would be: My son goes to a school where they don't do not. Um, is it Naviance or? Um, sure. Yeah, they don't have that at his school. They they do college prep in you know in the school, but I'm wondering: Are there websites like that available if you're not in a public school? And also, just the extracurricular question. Thank you. Holly, I'll let you take it. Yeah. Um, so in terms of extracurricular, do you mean um, how, like looking at extracurriculars at a school to see if those match or oh, kind of preparing for? Preparing for the application, like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, that's an important, so the activity list is how a student is, you know, demonstrates their, their extracurricular activities and commitments. Um, so they'll be able to list 10 activities, uh, you know, what they, what they do with it, how long they've been involved in it, and then rank them in order of importance uh, to them. Uh, what is the purpose of this? Is, is several things. What, what, what colleges are looking for is, you know, to see that a student is active and engaged, um, but also to see certain characteristics, right? Like, you know, is, is, does a student demonstrate a leadership? Um, they don't have to be president of everything. I often consider, and I tell students that if you've, if you've taught or tutored or, or did some sort of mentorship activity, that that can also fill that box in, in certain ways um, because, you know, it shows many of those skills or if, like a managerial responsibility at work. So it doesn't have to be like an elected office like a, or a, a team captain. Um, I'd also like to see uh, some, I'd say, physical activity. Team sports are great because it shows certain personality traits that can lead to college success, right? That you can work with others, uh, that you can, you know, push through adversity and things like that. Um, but if team sports aren't in the cards for for a student, um, some act, like you know physical interest or activity is is very useful. It's just good for you know showing showing balance and and um, ad adaptivity and I think kind of healthfulness as well. Um, so the idea is that it doesn't have to be that a student is like super strong in all of these things. Um, it's nice to have these bases covered um, and some sort of like volunteerism or service is, is another thing. Um, but then we'd like to see a, a strength or a peak in, 
in like one to two areas. Um, so ideally, we should start to see something that really stands out and is interesting um, and is reflected through several activities. Um, and I think that that's often, I don't think sometimes students are relieved when I tell them that. <laughs> I was like, no, you don't have to do like 80 different things. But it's like, if you love photography, find a way to volunteer with photography in mind. Or, you know, like, can you can you help someone with their website uh, for a cause? Can you, you know, do you tie in some of these other boxes with a central interest? Um, and if that is somehow related to a school, like if, if that's related to their area of study or a school has a strength, that's a way that you're showing fit not just telling them that you fit, but you're really showing it with the application. Okay, yeah. Thanks, Holly. And Sherry, your other question was about um, oh, what do you do if you don't have Naviance or If you score? don't have access to that, yeah. Are there other like, you know, online things like that? Um, mm -hmm. Before you answer that, Holly, I wanted to, I'm just gonna throw a, a link in the chat here. Um, we put together a number of free guides on our website um, and we have one on the activity list, which is what oh, Holly was just talking yeah. about. Um, it's a little bit more about like how to make the most of that part of your application, not so much how do you develop your extracurricular profile, but that could be helpful to you as well. So I wanted to share that. Now back to you, Holly. Okay, I clicked on it and then I like, up in my screen. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, replacements for novice. And Sheila, you can fill us in if I don't know about one. I don't think there's one that's going to pull data as richly um, as, as Naviance or score and compare it with peers. Okay. So it's unfortunate that there's not going to be like that exact resource. Yeah. I think you'll have to um, take, you know, on, on a 4.0 scale, like what probably it's kind of hard, but probably like the unweighted might be easier and look at some of the charts that we included in, in this. Um, oh, okay. This. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know of another resource, Sheila, that might be more interactive? Well, it depends on what aspect of Navi Answer Score you're looking for. It sounds like you might be talking about the scattergram portion where it shows you like this student with this GPA and this test score got in or didn't get in. Yeah. Um, Exactly. So there is, there is not a place that tracks that. Um, but um, in a way, the averages that a school lists um, or that are on a website like collegeresults.org or Big Future or even the GPA versus SAT score um, charts that, that Holly screen shared, um, those averages are based on you know, people who've gotten in. Um, so it's not going to tell you who had something above that and didn't get in. Um, but you know, those are the averages for the admitted um, admitted students in a in a given year. Um, so that can be helpful. Yeah, um, there are just so you're all aware, there are websites out there that will claim to chance you and like tell you your probability of acceptance. Um, those are based on that kind of publicly available data. Um, but I'm always very hesitant when a student tells me, oh, I have a 93% chance of getting into, you know, Brown or whatever it is based on this website that doesn't even know me. Um, and, and so, you know, take those with a big grain of salt. <laughs> those things are, are a little bit, a little bit sketchy. Thank you. Thank yeah, you're welcome. We had a question from Gina. Any special advice for how to choose the early decision school? It's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, well, definitely. So know which schools are early decision and early action um, and, and have, have a very clear sense of that. Um, so a student's top choice school might not offer early decision. Um, and so you know, you, you want to make sure that you're, you're clear on that because with the early decision, um, with a, a, you know, a binding application, you'd want to make sure that that's, that's a top school, school that a student would go to um, if admitted. It's, it's a strategic move if, if you're able to get to that point of, of really knowing um, and expressing a lot of interest in that school. Um, the reason why it's strategic is that it improves the school's yield. Um, so they're looking to raise their profile and their, you know, kind of like their selectivity by admitting only, you know, admitting those students that they know will come. Um, and then if their yield improves, uh, so does their status. Um, so ultimately it's a way of really clearly expressing interest and commitment to a school. Um, I would say that, you know, 
if another if if the real choice school is is early action um, or is non-binding, um, don't go into a, a binding application process unless you're quite sure about it. I'll um, color that with an example while we're waiting for a next question. One of my students this last year really loves the city of Chicago. Um, you know, highly qualified student, and you know, also very humble and very sweet, and uh, was very interested in both University of Chicago and Northwestern, and um, I'm forgetting the third school, another school in that area. And he was sort of like, you know, I'd be happy to go to any of them, so I'm not going to early decision to any of these schools. I'm just going to early action, and we'll see what happens. Um, or I think one of them he could do early action and the other ones he couldn't. Um, and he kind of danced around this for a little while. And then finally, I talked to his parents who were like, listen, he really wants to go to University of Chicago. He's just nervous that he won't get in. And so he doesn't want to put himself out there. Um, and what I counseled them to do was, you got to put yourself out there. If you are that sure that that is the right school for you, and you know, he worked with me and I, I felt confident that it was a good fit for him as well. Um, as did his high school college counselor. Um, and you have all your materials ready and um, you know they are the strongest they're gonna be by that November 1st deadline, which is another key factor in early applications. You, you've got to get them done early. Um, you know, If all those pieces fall in line, then there is no reason you shouldn't do it because early action and early decision do have higher acceptance rates than regular decision. Um, and you want to you know, stay aware that sometimes that increase or perceived increase in acceptance rates comes from, you know, the school letting in their um, recruited athletes or legacy students or children of big donors. Um, that tends to happen in the early rounds, so it's going to pump up the application uh, or the acceptance rate. Um, but it also does really demonstrate that interest um, and helps the student just get some peace of mind. Um, and, you know, thankfully my student was accepted early decision to Chicago. Uh, and that is where he's heading next year. And, you know, we're all so proud of him, but he almost didn't do it because he was nervous uh, about really putting himself out there. So uh, I say, go for it. Um, when students work at Signet, uh, work at, with Signet on um, their admissions, uh, we always encourage at least one early application, whether that's early action or early decision, um, because it does improve your chances. Um, and it's also um, an earlier deadline to get them, you know, really pushing to get things done sooner so we're not dragging our feet. So I hope that's helpful, Gina. So, yeah, thank and you. I just love to reiterate the point of like being bashful. Uh, or, you know, being uh, the fear of rejection can really get in the way of a lot of students. Um, so you want to have a balanced list that's important, right? Like, you know, understand kind of where, where you stand, um, but don't be shy about expressing interest, about really loving uh, a top choice school. Yeah, it does make it harder to, you know, if it doesn't work out and you get rejected, but that's the way that you give it your best shot um, is by really wanting to go there and telling them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we probably have time for one more question. Anybody got anything? Um, hello, Sheila. Hi. Hi, Sheila. This is Yun. I'm Hi. sorry, I joined. I joined late, so I missed most of um, the uh, presentation. That's uh, right. So if, if if this has been already covered, please forgive me. And uh, my question is about choosing safe schools. Uh, nowadays, I heard because everybody's applying for so many schools and for schools to protect their yield, um, safe schools are not safe anymore. They would just <laughs> take a look at to say. Uh, you know, you're not going to come here, so I'm not going to accept you. So how do we deal with situations like this? That's an excellent question, Yen, and one we did not go into into detail. So I'm going to let Holly answer that. Now. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the, the key things is really expressing interest in, you know, these the safety schools. Um, and that starts by finding ones that a student actually really wants to go to. Um, I know that's a challenge that often you know, people's focus, you know, you're like, okay, I'll get into this school. That's why it's on the list, plunk. You know, it's just there to make me feel better. Um, but what we found in, 
uh, you know, as, as you were, you were saying is that now these schools, it's not always guaranteed like the, you know, target schools that you might get into it. Um, it's as important as ever to have safety schools that a student knows a lot about, has prepared a very strong application for, um, and is, would be excited to go to. Um, the reason why I think that's important too is because, as you said, these, these schools are trying to increase their yield. So if a student applies without demonstrating any interest, um, right, you know, if they've just been on the website once, uh, haven't gone on a tour, and don't give thought if there are supplemental materials, then yeah, they're going to think that the student's not going to go there. Um, and so we have, we've had a lot, of, I mean, I recently saw a student that was rejected from University of Vermont for, I assume this reason, like otherwise quite qualified. Um, and it likely was because that there wasn't um, strong interest uh, expressed in that. So I think it's a balance of choosing schools that are, you know, realistically would be safety range, um, but also treating them like a real application that, you know, we're serious about. Oh, I see. So, so would you recommend, because we can visit all the colleges that were interested, so would you recommend really visit the safe schools instead of the dream schools? I mean, like, you know, Harvard, if you get in, does it matter that you visit it or not? <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, that's a great one. I'll, I'll take that, Holly, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, you're right. Um, Harvard doesn't really care if you demonstrate interest because their yield is, is yep. not 100%, but it's above 95%. So they're not too worried about that. Um, my advice is to visit any school that you can visit um, because it's only going to help your student make better decisions. Um, even if it's a school that they're not particularly interested in, they're going to see an example of something that might exist on a campus that they are interested in, uh, and it's going to help them nail down those preferences. But for your safe schools or likely schools, depending on what terminology you like to use, um, it can be very helpful to visit, um, if for no other reason than to increase your students' enthusiasm for, the, for that school or to give them something specific to talk about. Um, another way to demonstrate interest is not necessarily visiting, but, you know, having a conversation with a student or an admissions officer from that school um, can also be a really great way to do that. Okay, I see. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, it was really wonderful to hear your questions. Um, and yeah, do, do not hesitate to reach out if you have any other questions and expect that follow-up email uh, with those documents. All right. Take care. Thank you.